Everyone, welcome to another episode of Founder Wisdom Podcast. Today with us, we have Vasily Brandt. He is founder and CMO at Blazar, co-founder at Blazar. He was Forbes 30 under 30. He's an e-commerce uh, magnet. We're going to talk like VC. We're going to talk about popular brand that you might even be wearing right now. And the future of e-commerce, because things are moving pretty quick in the influencer world as well. So Vas, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about Blazor? Sure, Charles. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for, for having me here. Um, so yeah, to introduce Blazor Capital, it's a, it's basically a, a brand incubator and uh, investor within the e-commerce consumer space that we started back in 2017 or myself and two friends who quit our jobs in 2017. And then we actually went live in, in Star Q2 2018. We started off by launching two brands from scratch, one watch company and one eyewear company, and have then since uh, built a multiple brand and invested in quite a few as well. So today now, what is this, five years later, five and a half years later, we're now involved in around uh, 25 companies, six, to seven of which that we have built ourselves and the rest are um, investments. And uh, yeah, these companies, they basically range in size from completely started, just started recently to uh, to up or to around, I think the largest case expects to do around 35 million USD in revenue this year. Um, so it's it's around 30, 32 million USD in revenue. So it's around, around that level that some of the cases are at. Um, we basically, the, the, the most prominent case we've launched since the beginning are Nord Green, which is a Danish uh, design watch company that offers extremely sustainable products at, uh, at reasonable prices. We've long, launched a, a Chamberlain Coffee, which we did together with Emma Chamberlain in the United States, a big uh, Gen Z influencer. Uh, so that was launched a bit more than two years ago and it's also doing really well. And we did an eyewear company uh, called Messy Weekends, which uh, among other things did a collaboration with Logan Paul also and his brand Maverick uh, last year. So we've launched quite a few different brands together with some amazing founders who are, who are leading the different cases and have really been been growing our cases through uh, a talent-driven approach uh, since, since basically early days where we have done collaboration with celebrities or built uh, brands with them. So that's kind of, it's kind of in a nutshell uh, who, who, who we are and then we do also own a few or have invested in a few um, uh, tech solutions. We basically, among, among other things, we acquired a company called Dream Influencers 100%, which is uh, an influencer platform for scouting, recruiting, communication, and campaign management of influencer marketing. Uh, and we've also uh, invested in a in, in a supply chain, e based on e-com supply chain platform called uh, Hakio, and we own co-own a, a tech agency and, and a marketing agency as well that does services both internally and across our brands, but also the services externally, externally to companies uh, all around the world. Super impressive. Um, first question on that $35 million, let's say, what are the margins typically? Because I told you I used to run my uh, nootropic supplement company where margins were quite thin. I think we were making like 15, 15% uh, profit, which is super small. Uh, is that the usual margin in e-commerce, and how do you increase that margin? So, I mean, in our case, we 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 usually work with sixty to eighty percent uh, gross profit margins. That's where we like to to be at. Of course, it, it differs from category to category, where you know everything products like skincare, in many cases, also vitamins, supplements, um, and things like that can be obtained at a, at a high high margin. Uh, jewelry as well, watches. You see that too. Whereas um, fashion to a high extent and um, and uh, basically perishable products, whether it's uh, it's, um, it's protein powder, whether it's uh, whether it's coffee Supplement. or things like that, you know, that has like a twelve month shelf life or less, we tend to see that margins a bit lower than. Uh, so so it differs from case to case, and I mean in our in, in our case everything we do is is vertical, so it's it's private label brands that we that, that we sell on a D two C basis or through retail. But we source everything direct from the manufacturers, and we usually don't use any agents or middlemen when it comes to the sourcing. So we go straight to the manufacturers, and that also, of course, gives us a higher margin compared to if we, as an example, had agents uh, sourcing product for us in, in different parts of the world. 
It's interesting that you decided to expand in B2C. It's probably because of your experience. Me, I tested B2C and, and B2B, and with the margins of B2B, I was instantly almost sold, you know? I'm curious as per why you decided to, to really double down on B2C. Obviously, the market's always bigger, but I find that consumers are, are kind of difficult to deal with. They're not really professional, and it's not the, the same standards and the, the values I, I hold myself up to. So why did you decide to double down on the B2C market and let's say not the B2B? So for us, um, so basically both myself, but also my other co-founders, we all come from a D2C, I have D2C background. Uh, I personally worked at, at the health group in the, in the UK or called THG, uh, which I IPO'd last year, which is also a vertically integrated consumer group that owns like 40 consumer brands, uh, most of which are also vertical. So kind of, we all have experience from, 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 from doing business like that. Um, but it is definitely also a much more scalable model uh, or, you know, it, it, it was definitely the case uh, from 2000 and, 13, I would say, and until and until a year ago or so, uh, when marketing prices on, on, on online channels were extremely lucrative. So if you had high margin products, you had, you had a big group to play with from a cost of sale perspective. But I would argue that in, the, in, a, in, a, in a world that we live in today, where marketing costs have increased substantially on the different digital medias and where it has become harder to track and target and and uh, and uh, and basically use data compared to before due to various things, you know, the ATT update from 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 Apple and uh, basic GDPR regulations and and so on and so forth. You know, it's it's becoming much more hard to 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 um, create profitable brands, even though you have a lot of room to play. And so the scalability has become lower than before, but even then, it's still, in my opinion, at least, much more a much more scalable business business model compared to if you go through pure P2P from the beginning. And, what do you and then also, I think, I think also an important point is that it's hard to build a brand today and go into B2B immediately, uh, a consumer brand, because there's, there's an overflow of consumer brands in all industries, more or less, right? So all wholesalers and distributors, and retailers, they get so many inquiries that you need to differentiate yourself and really tell them why they should choose you among instead of a lot of others. And the best way of doing that is by, by saying that you have a product that already have traction, traction right online or through your own vertical physical stores. So I think it's also hard to launch a brand to be fair and just say we go B2B from the beginning. It's definitely possible, but it's going to take a long time to build that retail network. 100%. And what do you think about Apple uh, cracking down on that? Apple has the data on their consumers. They probably know better than you and I what they want. But again, you know, that's a value thing of with consumers like me, I don't mind receiving an ad. It's even good for me or a cold email. It, it might be something that I need and I don't believe in, you know, over regulating it or just over protecting the consumers. What do you think about their policies from an unbiased um, perspective? You know, do you think it's really what consumers want to not receive these ads or to receive more personalized ads? What's your opinion on it? And consumers are different, right? So, I mean, I personally like personal ads. I hate to get ads that, that I don't care about, that have nothing to, to do with me. Others, they think it's creepy to get things that they that they, that they desire and they need, that they need and want. Uh, so, I mean, people people are different. People have different requirements. I think Apple's choice um, is it's a massive decision, right? Because it's it's really really affecting a lot of companies around them using their network, using their 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 phones uh, to 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 advertise um, through different platforms uh, on it. And the, and the apps on the phone, obviously. Um, I mean, it, 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 this the, the whole situation of really the, the reason why Meta and Snapchat and all these guys are struggling so much because they have no control over the hardware themselves, right? Google is less affected because they have the the full the full infrastructure also with with Android and, and devices and hardware on their side. Um, and I think I think this is just now that they need to adjust, but also also marketeers need to adjust. This is just no way around it, right? You see that also. Meta now is investing extremely heavily, heavily in the meta, metaverse and all the hardware around that, so they get much more control over the future, the future uh, placements and, and, and platforms that they're going to offer marketeers and brands. Uh, but I think right now we're just in a situation where we as co companies and, and brands um, and platforms using uh, using phone phone devices uh, by Apple just need to need to adjust. And I think it's an interesting time because the whole idea of, of 
performing hardcore perform performance marketing where everything's just about being data driven and, and almost reach based, you know, it's just not possible in the same extent as we've seen a couple of years ago, which means that we much more than ever are going back to basics, right? I mean, Coca-Cola built, uh, you know, a massive billion dollar company historically without any digital assets, right? You, they did it just through, through the, the offline world. Well, the same did McDonald's, the same, the same did the other massive American and, and worldwide com company. So it is possible to build extremely big companies without using digital networks and being able to target exactly what you want. It's just about doing marketing in a different way. And, you know, we're adjusting to that. A lot of brands are doing that now. And it, to me, it's just, it's just interesting. It's, it's complicated. It's comprehensive. It's a bit annoying from now, from time to time, but I think it's also, it's also an, an exciting challenge. Yeah, because innovation only happens in mass constraints uh, is something that I found, you know, like people freak out when there's recessions and when they don't have the same budgets and all that. I find it so interesting and I find it super healthy. You know, it's just like going to the gym, breaking a muscle. Uh, you need that to grow as an entrepreneur, as a company. So, yeah, it's it's fascinating. What, what kind of... Uh, innovation are you putting forward because yeah last year the year before that was web tree right like oh you're in marketing you need to innovate with with web tree this year we're seeing a massive boom in ai for example so how are you guys innovating uh to to get a nice return on these uh ad spend dollars so i mean blazer capital is obviously focused on consumer products and, and e-commerce. So it's not like we are going into, into the metaverse now or into AI or into a, into a web, three, web, 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 web three or anything like that. We we're focusing on the consumer space. That's kind of what, you know, the universe we've built in the, the, the space in which we are, we're going to operate for, for the for the next couple of years. And um, but let's say you integrate chat GPT on the website uh, to, for someone to have a better supplement recommendation that, that could be an interesting and personalized way to to innovate no could be i mean we're we're implementing these 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 ai solutions in our b2b software products so as an example dream influence as you mentioned before uh which is our influence platform we have it's it, we've already discussed how can we implement uh you know the 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 the, the different ai solutions into that platform to help the the users uh, basically create more effective and efficient campaigns uh etc et so in that case it makes sense from a D2C point of view, it could also it could also be an option to 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 go in that direction. For us, the innovation comes more in in looking at the challenges there is in the current world, and then creating products or consumer products that kind of overcome these challenges. So as an example, if we know that marketing costs are growing uh, at extremely extremely rapid pace, I mean, in some of our brands, as an example, we've seen three x uh, increases in, the, in our marketing costs on on a CPC and CPM basis. Then we know it's going to be much more expensive to acquire customers, which in return means that we need to create products that have a high repeatability because then, okay, fine, we can, we can afford losing money in the first, but if we then have people coming back three, four, five times and our capital LTV, then it's healthy, then everything is good. As, as an example, we've gone away from launching brands that have single uh, sale items to something that is more repeatable. We also know that repeatability and problem solving go, goes hand in hand. So if you have a product that solves a problem, and it's repeatable, then people are inclined to keep buying it because it actually is good for them for whatever reason that may be. It could be, it could be weight loss. It could be, it could be a beard growth. It could be hair loss. It could be, you know, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, it could be if you have psoriasis or the, the skin diseases and you create like amazing products to, to help solve these on a non-pharmaceutical basis, because we're not, a, we're not, a, we're not, a, we're not a, a medical company. So it's always within the, the functional cosmetic space in these examples. So that, you know, so we try to say, okay, what are what are the 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 the, the, the issues taking place in the world within the consumer space? And how do we overcome that? So that's more how we innovate. Um, so even though there's a lot of amazing opportunities from an AI perspective and and, and the metaverse, and we saw crypto last year. Now now that has obviously crashed a lot. Um, now we don't really take that to us to a large extent. I'm saying. I love we it. use it, however, in our platforms and the third-party platforms we use, right? So we definitely. They adopt open AI, for example, on copywriting. We use all the, the AI uh, solutions that the different marketing platforms they apply, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, Metas or Google's or, or others, right? So we were using it, but for our own products and our own brands, it's not something that we're doing at a great extent. Love it. Um, I want to hear about your process of 
because we just discussed about consumer need. Is that how you start product development? Because you and I talked last time about going influencer first, which is even more interesting and which is how I would probably start a, a D2C company because I'm going to try myself at it again. I just never give up. And I mean, it, I, I love building great products that people can use, whether that's a, a Neuralink or a, a Levels a Blood Glucose or the, the Apple Watch that's going to test your blood glucose pretty soon as well. Uh, I'm a consumer as well, obviously. Do you go with influencer first, like who's who's hot, who's not right now, and developing a product with them? For example, yesterday I was listening to my first million podcast, and they were interviewing this 51-year-old guy that run a two-hour, 29 minutes marathon in Tokyo, which is fucking incredible. It's like, yeah, it's impossible feat almost. I, I would just like reach out to this guy and, and start really promoting him. He's really early in his uh, influencer career. And I think that's how I would start product or kind of merge this guy with one product idea. And obviously he's in my niche, he's in the health niche. Um, so it's like, is that how you would also start a new product? We're looking more at, at uh, talent-driven company building, right? So where we use influencers or celebrities to, to build brands. We have actually, since the very beginning of Laser, been very active in this space, but not from a brand building perspective, but more from a product collaboration perspective. So we've almost since day one co-created products with influential people. As an example, in our watch company, we did a collaboration with the biggest musician in Denmark, a guy called Christopher, and he launched his own watch that he was a part of the, he, he was a part of the design process, kind of it was his design. Uh, we did uh, support a charity that he uh, that he also liked, and that was also incorporated into the case back of the watch, right? We did the same with a big influencer called uh, Matilda in Denmark also. She has a bit more than a million followers. She did the full design of the watch together with our designer and did a lot of regular content around that. So we've always been very talent driven. We also acquired, as mentioned before, Dream Influencers and the whole co-founding team is still a part of the company, just driving it forward, really, really kind of innovating their, their way through the whole influencer, the whole influence, influencer landscape, right? So that has always been the case, but now we're focusing more on also building brands with influencers from the very scratch so that they are the face of the brand from the beginning and that the brand is built on their personal foundation, so to speak, right? So as mentioned before, we, 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 we have helped um, the Chamberlain coffee team build her brand as well. Um, so the, the, the coffee company over in Los Angeles and have helped co-create it or create the, the, the organization structure over there, hire an executive team, and, and they're now running with a bowl and, and doing an amazing job. And we just see that that building a brand with an influential influential person that has that follow-up base that is really, really excited about whatever he or she launch launches is kind of a, a bit of an unfair competitive advantage compared to if you start something without an influencer, right? Um, but you know, so there's a lot of pros with it. There's also some some challenges you need to be aware of in terms of obviously there will be other stakeholders involved as well. And, you know, building a talent-driven brand has requirements that aren't present compared to if you launch a brand without. Uh, but at least in my opinion, especially in a world where, again, marketing costs are becoming really, really high and targeting is becoming complicated, et cetera, et cetera. Influence and marketing as a whole is becoming much more prominent. And for that reason, I do also believe that launching uh, brands with talents uh, has become much more relevant compared to what you just saw a few years ago. How do you initially reach out to these influencers and are these influencers hard to communicate with after you started the project with them? Sorry, can you repeat that? The connection just yeah. fell off. So two questions in one. How do you initially outreach to those influencers? Are they tough to get a hold of initially? And then once you start the product, the project, how is their communication style? Are they hard to get a hold of? Or is, is that easier when uh, you start working with them? Yeah, so I mean, it depends on how big the influence is that you want to work with, right? So if you want to have a mega influencer that has 10, 20, 50, 100 million followers, then, you know, they're all managed by really prominent uh, agencies out there. And it's all about getting in touch with these agencies. I mean, getting in touch with the talent itself is, I would say, almost close to impossible. Uh, they have agents around them to take care of all these things. It's about getting in touch with them. And they also get inquiries from a lot of different brands every day, just in standard collaborations, right? Uh, and they probably also get inquiries about brand building from time to time. 
And it's super important that you have a foundation that obviously is extremely strong, that they believe in, and that they also trust in. Because whenever you, you onboard a talent to a case, whether it's a collab or build a brand, they also a bit risking their reputation in case it goes, it goes badly, right? So it is important for the agency that represents the talent that they work with, with someone or an organization that they can really trust and that they really believe in. And that's also why you see that a lot of the bigger talents, they, they launch brands with, with big institutions, basically, right? From the very beginning, as an example, I know that, um, I'm pretty sure that it was MVMH that, uh, that recently also launched a case from scratch with one of the big talents over in the US and things like that. So, so that's, I think that, that that's number one, you need to get a good relation with these agencies and obviously, um, yeah, create the, the trust that it requires and for them to also see that you have a, a strong foundation to build on. And once you are alive and the communication is, it's obviously not like I can just send a WhatsApp to, to, to an agent and, and get an answer right away if it includes the, if it's organized around the talent. Uh, so things take more time, things has to be more planned, things need more iterations. You can't just do things on an ad hoc basis in the same way as if you do something without a talent. And this is even on collab basis, right? So when we do collaborations in our, in our brands that are not, are not talent-led, even these collaborations, whenever we need to do a change or do an update or do whatever, it needs to be in tandem with, with, with the agency and, and the talent himself or herself. So things take, take, to, to take longer and things are a bit more complicated for sure. Um, but uh, but if, if, if you know what you're doing and you believe that it's, it's the right way, it's, it's also going to be worth it. Do you have a couple minutes more? Or do you have a, another meeting coming up? I'm good. My right. biggest problem is battery, actually. So I just need to bring my charger if it's too long. Because I have three more questions <laughs> that are like quite relevant here. Um, first thing first, how is the VC, the D2C VC industry doing right now? We've been seeing tech VCs doing really bad. Is capital scarce this year? Like what, what are your projections for 2023 and 2024? There's no doubt that both investors within the consumer space, so e-com or, or physical retail, and investors within the whole, you know, the, with the tech space, whether it's B2B, SaaS, or other things, they are very hesitant at the moment, right? Everyone is is, is holding holding their horses, uh, observing the market, and uh, and I guess waiting for things to become become better. I mean, the current situation is. No, nobody really knows where things are going. Uh, we just saw that inflation rates again increased in the US, which is probably also going to result in the interest rate, interest rate going further up, right? And we are now at a, at a level that is that is already pretty heavy. So, uh, I mean, there's there's very few large investments going on on at the moment, and we see a lot of companies doing good doing down rounds, and so so it's definitely definitely tough times. Um, I do obviously expect things to get better, uh, whether it's going to be in a year or two, it's, it's hard to say. The interesting part is that a lot of funds, they raised a lot of cash throughout 2020 due to the liquidity that was in the market. And a lot of this cash has not been deployed. And um, so I do think there will be a phase where a lot of this dry powder will be will be released and injected into companies uh, all around the world. Um, and it is going to be beyond just AI, which is hard at the moment. There will be investments taking place at a big scale. I think within e-commerce, there will be investments in in, in a lot of other categories. I'm, I'm not worried about that. It's just that it's just a question of time. I think consumer goods, especially, I mean, physical products, it has always been there, right? It's not like tomorrow there'll be no demand for physical products or consumer goods. So, so there will be there will be investors, and they're just looking for the right cases and the and the, and the right time. And if you just look at the biggest companies in the world, you know, a lot of them are consumer companies, even in top twenty. I think it's the majority right now, together with with big tech so um right now it's tough for sure investors are holding back but uh it's a question of time when when it's going, going to normalize a bit more again i think it's getting I think also value, 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 yeah. where valuations were, were very much inflated especially in 2020 oh, yeah. 21 so i think we're going to see a market with with significant lower valuations and with a much stronger focus on profitability and not just uh just uh, increase top line with an acceptance of a high burn. I think that, I think that time is, is definitely over for now, at least. Yeah, we need corrections so that this market can behave rationally. And in the tech VC world, it was just crazy, you know, like all these new VCs with no experience, pretty much getting like free free money or like I can lose type of money. 
um, and just investing it all over the place. As soon as they saw an AI in a company, I just was flabbergasted and could never really figure out like how they could um, invest in, in X startups and afford to lose so much, um, which leads me to that next topic, which is the VC industry. You could have chose to, to stay as an operator in your e-commerce businesses and as we know, like listening to many uh, prominent angel investors like Neville Ravikant, uh, finance and, and money is, is a huge leverage. Um, there's obviously the human leverage, there's the software leverage, which I prefer so much more, uh, automation and so forth. But the, the money leverage is, is quite uh, powerful. Um, you're in the business of managing money, not necessarily managing business, although you might give uh, mentorship to these founders. So your role is kind of make sure that the, the numbers are right and so forth. And capital, if you can easily access it, if you have good relationships with the banks, if banks trust you, you can have pretty much tons of it and just re redistribute it on many bets. So I'm curious to hear about your mindset when it comes to going all in in the VC world vs just running and operating a company, which one of the model is better? Yes, some people prefer to operate business, but me, my thesis in the end, obviously, if you manage money, you're just going to make more of it. And it's just more scalable to manage your, your investments in a portfolio. I think you can get richer that way. Am I wrong in thinking that? I mean, it depends on your approach, it depends on your company and, and your business model, essentially, right at the end of the, at the, end of the day. If, you, if you're just a, 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 an institution that, that purely invests capital into, into startups and founders, I mean, then you are essentially a, a VC fund, right? If you create a fund, you raise, raise, raise a lot of capital from institutions, family offices, uh, private people, and, and deploy that into individual cases and stay, stay off, obviously, with, with advice now and then. And, strategic insight and insights and, and, and advice then that then it's just a standard vc model right and i think in our case we we are much more operational from the very beginning but our ownership stake is also very different to a vc so a vc usually comes in and get gets 10 percent 20 percent and you know in some cases it's 30 but I, I, you don't see that very often and whereas when we build something we we usually start almost with 100 percent, right if not 100 percent, then with 80 percent because we have a founder two founders that have a part of it at 70 percent. so the, 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 the core case that we launch out from scratch, we start at a really high level uh, ownership wise, and then we slowly go down over time, right? Uh, so it's, it's, a different, it's a different model. And it's the same model that Rocket Internet, as example, they had uh, back in their glory days. I'm actually not sure exactly how they're doing anymore. I think they delisted, but, but, uh, but that, it was the same, right? They always launched a company, they owned it 100%, they then gave equity away to some founders, and then Basically, over time, the more investments they got from a bottom-up perspective, the more and more they got diluted. This is essentially the, the same thing that you, you're seeing with, with our cases and then the, the case that we are part of. They own their companies 100%. So they basically, basically, you know, acquire consumer brands from the very scratch and 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 run and operate them uh, completely within the group, and then they centralize a lot of the activities and use the central teams, uh, the central teams for that. So. Yeah, I mean, there's there's different way of, of doing it, and we're we're not a VC. We are we have an investment arm, but the core part of the business is that we are a company builder. Got it. So, like, if I understand, you really start from scratch. You don't like uh, check a business and see it, see how they're doing and acquire them. You really incubate these startups. Like, how do you find the the talent? Let's say that. How do you find a CEO to to actually run a company? What's your process for that? Yeah, it's um, it's super important that, that the co-founder team of each case is, is is absolutely stellar from the very beginning. And what we've learned is that it's it's very powerful to have two founders uh, on the case from the beginning that complement each other, but still quite different. What we've seen has worked really well is to have one very entrepreneurial marketing kind of uh, candidate, you know, who is creative and who who comes up with a lot of ideas and understands branding, and understands performance marketing, and uh, is still data driven and analytical. But together, you, but 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 that that person should be should be co-founding the brand together with somebody somebody who's a bit more consulting, like a person who maybe have been in banking or in the consulting industry, who is very um, very problem-based, uh, very analytical, very, very data-driven and really has a strong financial understanding and things like that, right? Somebody who can be more on the helicopter uh, and, and see, see, see the overarching business performances and who can also ensure that all the operations 
a function function effectively and efficiently based on on all the activities that is done by the other co for co -founders. So that kind of mix we've seen work 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 really well. And basically, we spend a lot of energy and time on, on finding the right candidates and really um, outline a, a, a top list of people that we would love to get on board that fit the brand and and basically just reach out to them and try to to, to involve them. Right and. We we always uh, offer a, a strong equity package to 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 the the profile together with a, a salary that's good enough for for, for somebody to, to live a complete normal life. But of course, not that you can afford to on a daily basis to go on a Michelin restaurant or whatever. But it is the equity that we are that we are that we are trying to motivate the the, the founders on, and it's also with with pretty strong equity packages, and it, it usually Very works. Cool. Yeah. Last question: How do you measure? if a company is effective or not, how much runaway do you give them until you pull the plug? And what happens to the, the startup after that? Do you just sell it? Or what happens if someone, it, a company in your portfolio is not performing to your expectations? So when we launch a company, we usually do it with around... Uh, 400,000 USD. That's kind of the, the, the baseline, the average baseline we, we inject into a brand that we launch from scratch. Uh, and that is usually enough to build a company, order the first uh, the first batch of products, um, start to do your marketing activities to reach a, a, a customer group and prove the concept. So kind of that's the level we add usually. And we we usually give a company a year, a year and a half to, to prove itself. And... Uh, and if we just see that the unit economics don't add up, you know, if we just see that we can't make the business profitable down to the, the gross profit, profit three margin uh, due to whatever reason, it can be that we can't get the CAC below a certain level, uh, the operating expenses are increasing, uh, getting, getting, getting too high, you know, the, whether it's the, the cost or whether it's the, the supply chain cost, you know, it could be a lot of different variables. We can't get the unit economic right. We usually just pull the plot and cut the case because then, it's it's usually hard to turn around if you already from the beginning see extremely bad numbers in that set in in, that, in in those areas, right? So, so yeah, we we have we have pulled the block plug in a few brands by now. Yeah, I would guess. So, what's the success rate typically? Is it 10, 20 percent, thirty? I mean, we're still quite young, so it's hard to say, right? I think even some of the brands we have today that do three, four, or five million dollar revenue, you can't. Yeah, I think their their success is not guaranteed just yet, right? You you've seen a lot of companies recently. All over the world, especially within the consumer space, that that have gone bust or been acquired for a very low price or whatever, right? Even though they actually did 10 million or 20 million USD or even more revenue, 20, you know, 30. Uh, so, so uh, I, th I think it's too early to say what the success rate is. But I mean, so far uh, we have launched more brands that are stable and doing well than brands we have pulled the plug on. Interesting. Well, thank you for today's interview. Vaz was really insightful. Where can people find out more about you? Of course. Thanks for, for, for having me. I mean, LinkedIn, Instagram, you can just Google my name and uh, connect me with me and whatever media fits you if you want to, if you have any questions or I would like to catch up.